Um, this is the talk titled Addressing Modern Day Circumstances, Challenging the Dignity of the Human Person. I would now like to introduce our presenter, Ms. Mary Huber. She was part of the Department of Life, Dignity, and Justice, working for the Diocese of San Bernardino for 24 years. She was born in Scotland, raised in Germany, and has lived in the United States since 1976. Mary has an undergraduate degree from Cal State Fullerton in international business and economics and a master's degree in pastoral theology and spiritual direction from Loyola Marymount in Los Angeles. She also earned a graduate certificate in healthcare from the National Catholic Bioethics Center in Philadelphia. Upon her departure from the diocese in 2021, she received the Episcopal blessing from the Most Reverend Alberto Rojas, and in 2022, she received the People of Life Award from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. As a director of Respect Life and Pastoral Care, she was responsible for programs that offered compassionate and practical assistance for those in need of pastoral care by promoting bereavement ministries and mental health programs in parishes, theological and practical support of end-of-life care, and spiritual healing for women, men, and families affected by pregnancy loss. Mary has since moved to Dayton, Ohio to be with her family and grandchildren. Let us give her a round of applause. Well, good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to be back. It's really wonderful to be back. I feel like I'm back with my family again. So can you hear me okay? Okay. Okay, so um, Sister Chile asked me to give a talk about the challenges that hurt the dignity of the human person. And at first I said to her, well, you need to find someone who could write six books on this, but I don't know how we could compact this in one hour. And she, her comment was, well, just tweak it a little bit. So I'm tweaking it. Um, there has been human suffering since the beginning of time. The task seemed overwhelming. But after much thought, I realized that the power that we have is within ourselves. How we act as Christian role models and how the cardinal virtues defined so eloquently by Saint Aquinas could guide us in this task. The answer is in our Christian anthropology our values, and our Christian responsibility to shine a light on the hurting world. So let me begin. <laughs> In the 17th century, the French philosopher René Descartes was challenged by the idea that there was no certainty in the world. Knowledge was relative and subject to doubt. Determined to find grounding in knowledge, he came up with the now well-known philosophical statement, I think, therefore I am. And with that changed the history of philosophy and human knowledge. We see today that one of our greatest challenges in society is moral relativism and the lack of a solid universal principle. Truth has been defined as a personal value and not a universal one. St. John Paul II, also a world-renowned philosopher in his own right, enlightened Descartes' statement by saying, I have first been loved, therefore I am. He, of course, goes back to Genesis that we were created in his image and likeness. Because we were first loved, we have been redeemed by Christ and willed by God to exist. We all exist because willed us, God willed us to be here. This is our Christian anthropology, our Christian hope. As God's children, we are heirs with Christ in heaven. But Christian love is not an individual love. Rather, it's one that's devoted to service and life. We collectively take up our different heritage, talents, and treasures, and become the bride of the church, bedecked in her jewels. We find hope in the passion of Christ. We find wisdom through scripture, through 2,000 years of church teachings, and through our saints and the fortitude by which they lived their lives. 
Aquinas, a doctor, St. Aquinas, a doctor of the church said that we participate in the purification of our sanctification. We just don't just exist or try to be good pe people. We actually play a very active role in the purification towards our sanctification. As part of humanity, we will always be subject to personal hardships, consequences, confusions, and personal sacrifices. But these hardships are open-ended. They don't portray the complete story. Evangelization is to share the good news of the gospel to a world that has lost sight of the bigger picture, often not knowing if we ever have a left an impact with them. How often have we said something, maybe it's even very flippantly, didn't think anything of it, and several years later, someone comes up to you and says, you know, when you made that comment, I had something to think about. It wasn't even well thought through when you made the comment, but it obviously was something that God wanted to use you as a vessel, a vessel for because it left an impact in someone's life. So very often we are evangelizing and we will never know the impact we have on other people, which is why we always have to be prepared for that. Jesus is our role model who shows us his battle wounds that came with proclaiming the truth. Christian hope means that when we suffer, Christ suffers with us. It's an everlasting friendship we have with him, where our life-affirming actions and ministry opportunities can deepen our faith, but indeed, our failings, mistakes, and past sins can become caveats towards an enhanced wisdom, empathy, and grace. Our battle wounds can guide us to what Aquinas calls the four cardinal virtues. It is where we find interior freedom and participate in the joy of the gospel. I was watching something on TV. I don't know what it was. It was something. Anyway, George Clooney got on. And he said, full people, George Clooney, he said, I have never learned anything from all of my successes. I have only learned from my failures. Now, this is George Clooney, who, at least in the popular world, has many successes. So I think we can take stock in the matter that all of our failures come with a lot of battle wounds and come with a lot of wisdom and come with a lot of hope and come as good role models for others to learn from. When thinking of challenges, my first thought was to consider the legal acts of, in this country, uh, particularly in California, that are so offensive to the dignity of human life, which of course is abortion, physician-assisted suicide, the death penalty, human cloning. Um, but then there's the other ones, the, um, the violence on the streets, the attacks on our business owners, the cyber attacks, the identity theft, and the list goes on. We have undoubtedly made big steps towards, to, uh, forward since the mid medieval times and more recent times of slavery, theft, and murder. But in many areas, evil has just been redirected. St. John Paul II coined the term culture of life versus culture of death. It was a term used in the church in the year 2000 that often signified the stance on abortion, which became pro-life versus pro-choice. It was unfortunate during that time because it's such a beautiful and loving document, and in many ways, because I, I worked here during that time, in many ways this beautiful encyclical became weaponized politically between pro-life and pro-choice, where most people really didn't even understand the definition of either of them. But the roots of his statements were so much deeper. So let me try to just explain a little bit using his words, what he meant in this beautiful, loving, encyclical. Culture of life meant that human life as a gift of God is sacred and inviolable. It is the principle that calls to be self-giving as a way to find interior freedom. It is within the giving of oneself that we find personal freedom and Christ peace. It is the principle of humility 
and including all into the human family. It is a message of mercy towards ourselves and others. St. Augustine said that the beginning of freedom is to be free of crimes. And through our sac sacraments, we can find that freedom through confession. The message of mercy that St. John Paul spoke so eloquently about means reconciling people with life, bearing witness to the meaning of genuine gift of itself and self. In the Gospel of Life in Sicago, St. John Paul brings home this point when he writes a letter to women who have had an abortion. He says, and I'm just pulling out a couple statements from the, it's a large letter. He says, as a result of your own personal experience, you can become one of the most eloquent defenders of all human life. And a new way of looking at all human life. It is a statement that has carried many people far. The term culture of death meant the devaluation of all human life to the point that we view life as a commodity. It gives us wrong understanding of the meaning of suffering. It involves self-absorption, apathy, poverty of mind, de degradation, and humiliation. So when we think of modern challenges to the dignity of human beings, our humbling understanding of faith and reason, as so well described by Pope Benedict XVI, we simply fall short. One of my best understandings of what Pope Benedict meant when he talked about faith and reason, and now all, bishop, all popes, all bishops talk about faith and reason. I, I point out Pope Benedict because he was such a world-recognized theologian, and one of his big emphasis to young people was that faith and reason came hand in hand. So one of my understandings that I, could un that I could wrap my head around the best was listening to Bishop Robert Barron when he was interviewed at Pope Benedict XVI's funeral and tried to explain what Pope Benedict meant by faith and reason. And what he said was that because the Pope was a man of great faith who knew Jesus as incarnate of the Logos, God's Logos, or reason, becomes mind and flesh, both. Therefore, anything that is reasonable, logical, or scientific would find a residence in Christ. So faith and reason do not contradict each other, rather it is a paradox. It's one because of the other. This, is, this explains J.K. Jesterson, who is an English author, a poet, um, he wrote many theatrical shows back in the day, and a philosopher who said, a madman is not someone who has lost reason, but rather someone who has lost everything but reason. As beings created in the image and likeness of God, we hurt when we hurt others, act contrary to the nature of our holy existence. Addictions separate us from God in relationships. Obsessions of material goods create a distraction and a loss of connectedness towards our family and neighborhoods. Um, to, um, to explain the relationship that I feel we have with our soul and God, if you look at migratory birds, know how to find their way over a thousand miles of unknown territory because they have small particles of magnetite embedded in their brains. A hummingbird migrating from Colorado to enjoy the warmth of Mexico in the winter does not become disoriented and get lost flying towards Chicago in the windy weather. Rather, it, does, it, finds, it knows exactly where it needs to go. Therefore, as Christians, it cannot be far-fetched to believe that our soul also has a magnetism that is guided by the Spirit, showing us which direction to go in. And yet our fear of failure, fear of abandonment, fear of success, fear of lack of control, sets us down 
a downhill spiral. When we lose faith, we lose hope. I was talking to a young lady, it was a friend of mine, and her, I was talking to her daughter who was in her late 20s, and I was saying to her, uh, backtrack a little bit, right now I work, uh, I actually work in Indianapolis, and I work for, um, I work for just a regular secular company, and 90% of the people I work with are Gen Cs. It's quite challenging. But um, anyway, and I remember saying to her daughter, Amanda, I go, I've never, I've just never seen so many people depressed who need a self-help day once a month or uh, a mental health day and are triggered just about anything, anything you say or do or exist, they're triggered by. And I said, I just, I struggle with that because they're smart, they're good, good people, and yet they're lost. And she just off the cuff said to me that statement, um, when we lose faith, we lose hope. And without hope, we can't thrive which is why we're seeing a level of depression and anxiety that is totally unprecedented. It is in this need to try and control every aspect of one's life, to reason through our decision-making process without faith, that we become vulnerable in making wrong life-affirming decisions. And here are our challenges in this country affecting the dignity of all human life. We can't, st since day one, there's been earthquakes, there's been phantom, there have been wars. Um, there are so many things we can pray a lot about, but we physically, individually can't do anything about. But it's this right here, when we as a society have lost hope to the point where anxiety and lack of control has become the main item on the menu. And, and because of that, the decision making that is done without faith that makes us so vulnerable, that's when these many challenges in our country start affecting the dignity of human life. And this is what St. John Paul was talking about when he talked about the culture of life. So um, our journey is unknown. The Holy Spirit teases us with little bits of information, and no matter how much we try to control things in life, God has his own plans for us, and they are generally much wiser plans. The biggest um, benefit of aging, the only benefit of aging, quite frankly, is that you figured that out, right? When I was in my 20s and I got out of college, man, I had my whole world all figured out. And it just went in oppositional directions, one by one by one. I never, ever thought I would work for the church, ever. It didn't even cross my mind. I was here 24 years. <laughs> so, and um, I never thought I'd work for a in a contractor's world at my age with 90% Gen Cs. But I think God's just trying to keep me young for a couple years until he finds what he really wants me to do. But the reality is we've all thought we had our life figured out. But the truth is God's got a plan, and it's so much better, thank God, than our plan. Um, I was looking at the Pew reports. So some of the most recent reports from Pew Research centers uh, notes that 20% of American adults identify as Catholics, which is a stable number that's continued over the last 10 years. Catholics tend to be older than Americans overall, but Hispanic Catholics trend younger. And I see that here. I mean, you can see the big difference between me going to church in the Midwest and me going to church here in California. Your churches are filled. Ours are not. Lately, our churches look filled because we merged three churches and shut down 70% of the masses. So it looks like we're just thriving. But the truth is, it's because we merged but you're thriving here in California, and you should be very proud of that, which is why I just need to come back here more often, just to get a little dose, dose of it. Um, just three in 10 US Catholics, 28% of the 20% that identify themselves as Catholic, say they attend Mass weekly. Pew compared this figure with, um, with Protestants, who attend 
uh, services, 40% of the people. So we are 20% less than our Protestant brothers and sisters, and yet our Catholic faith is founded by our sacraments, which you go to, the, you go to Mass for, the Eucharist. We come to Mass for the Eucharist, and yet 20%, 28% of the 20% Americans actually go to Mass. Um, about six in 10 Catholics say abortion should be legal in contrast to church teaching. This includes 39% who say it should be legal in most cases and 22% of Catholics who say it should be legal in all cases. So let's just, um, and again, a lot of this goes back to if it's legal, it's moral. Which again, is why it's so important that we really understand that connection between faith and reason. Because this is a good example where the Catholic Church tells us when something is wrong, and we know that it's reasonable that it's wrong, because reason and faith has to go side by side. So let's discuss values versus virtues. Values are good. Most people strive to live their lives with values. Dictating um, within the values that are dictated through their families, culture, and community. Our lives are filled with noble intentions, trying to do the right thing. We've heard the saying, our heart was in the right place. A healthy society cannot exist unless the majority of people strive to live in a world set with values. They are rules that are derived from life skills and healthy common sense. Treat your neighbor as you wish to be treated. Values are personal and in some sense outcome oriented. I hear the word at work karma a lot. Now these kids have no understanding whatsoever what their theological definition in Hinduism is about karma. So when they say karma, they're not referring to Hinduism or really anything. The, what they're referring to is, I'm going to be really, I'm going to do the right thing right now, even though this might cause me a little bit of grief, not a lot, but a little bit of grief, because I will have bad karma otherwise. And so, so values are often open-ended and um, task, um, what, uh, outcome oriented, because we're doing good things because we don't want to have bad karma about it. And I say whatever works, that's great. But, um, but we, of course, have such a better understanding than that. Virtues, um, virtues are so much more. The catechism defines virtues as an habitual and firm disposition to do good. We can give the best to God and others. As said earlier, Christian love is not an individual love. The theologian Edward Sree describes them as virtues that are so much more than values, rooted in the presence of God, in grace that enable us to establish and nurture healthy and life-giving relationships with God, our neighbor, the world, and ourselves. And actually, I highly, I highly recommend that if you ever can, read the book by Edward Sree on virtues. It's a beautiful book, and it's very uplifting. He, he explains it all in a way where we could actually all kind of participate in it. There are essentially four virtues from which Aquinas' um, extensive list flows. These virtues are prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. Aquinas refers to these virtues as the cardinal virtues. They are the principal habits on which the rest of the virtues hinge. So what is prudence? Prudence is cautiousness. According to the catechism, um, prudence is the virtue that disposes practical reason to discern our true good in every circumstance to choose the right means of achieving it. This is important when looking at challenges to the dignity of human life. Prudence does not just look at the rule book, but contemplates in deep reflection on the necessary good outcome of the action. Fortitude, strong in danger, 
resilient in pain and adversity. The moral virtue that ensures firmness in difficulties and constancy in pursuit of the good. It strengthens the resolve to resist temptation and to overcome obstacles in the moral life. They've, there have been books written about the great generation. Um, if there's anything that I can think of of the great generation is that these men and women had fortitude. They weren't heroes, uh, but they were heroes. They weren't saints. They made mistakes, but they had fortitude. The men and women in 9-11 had fortitude. And, um, and this is one of the main cardinal virtues. Temperance. I think this is one that, well, I can only speak for myself, but it's one that most people suffer from. Moderation in thought, feeling, and action. The moral virtue that moderates the attraction of pleasures and provides balance in the use of created goods. It ensures the will's mastery over instincts and keeps desires within the limits of what is honorable. We, like, we lack temperance because we live in a land of plenty. Um, Bishop, I was at the Eucharist Conference in Indianapolis because I was working there, I mean, in the city. And Bishop Barron had his, his, his large speech that he gave. He gave, he gave it, if you could ever Google Bishop Barron's speech, um, Eucharistic Con Congress, Indianapolis, it's about 45 minutes, supposedly it's the longest speech he's ever given. It's beautiful, and he's talking in front of 60,000 people. It was beautiful to see 60,000 people. There were a lot of Californians there, some actually walked from here, there. And um, he made a comment of, when we're talking about temperance, if you have everything you need, and in this country, which is different than other countries, that means a nice house, nice car, nice yard, nice motorcycle, you know, nice closet, nice everything. When you have had all of that, everything else is a distraction to you. And it belongs to, it belongs to the better good. It belongs to those who have less. Now, he said it much more eloquently than I'm saying it right now. But what I've realized with age is, as you get older and wiser, that bigger house also is a distraction, that nicer yard is a lot of work, that nicer car takes too much gas, and suddenly everything's just chipping away and chipping away, and it goes back to what Bishop Barron is saying, they are all distractions, and as you get older, you need less distractions in life. So um, I recommend that you all listen to his talk. It's very uplifting. And not only is it very uplifting, he's on fire because he's looking, he's looking at the future of the church in front of him because they're all young and it was beautiful. So justice, the last cardinal virtue, fair according to laws and rights versus needs to control. The Catechism says the moral virtue that consists in the constant and firm will give their due to God and neighbor. Why are these virtues so important in our life? How does that affect the dignity of all life? The Catechism says they are because a virtuous person does what is good consistently, easily, promptly, and joyfully. It's the joy of the gospel. So what is good? The golden rule, do, others, do to others what you would have them do to, unto you. Treat others with respect, kindness, and fairness. What is consistent? Habitual about our goodness. It doesn't have to become a chore. It becomes second nature. It becomes your, fuel, your soul nature. It starts to hurt when you're not that. That's kind of the evolution of it. First you want to be good, then you try to be good, then you are good, then you're more often good, then it becomes part of your nature to be good, and then it really, really hurts when you're not good. Um, what is consistent, habitual about our goodness, develop good habits, rituals. The church talks a lot about rituals. Uh, rituals are very important in our faith. Someone we can count on provides security to those that look for our 
guidance. This is so important when it comes to the relationship between parents and their children. Parents can't be fickle. They can't speak with a divided heart because parents might fail miserably in so many areas that when they're raising their children and teaching their children, they can't have a divided heart because kids get confused. And it's in that confusion that they get lost. And then once they lost, then we go through that whole thing again. Um, anxiety, lack of hope, depression, bad choices, no interior freedom. Parents need to teach them the truth. Just because a parent not necessarily can always abide by the truth and fails because they're human beings, they have to teach the truth. They can't teach with the divine. Do I say not as I do? That was like the joke in the 60s. You know, it's, it's not even funny. Okay, what is easily? We have to do this easily. It cannot be an effort. By making it happy, it becomes instinctive without moral confusion. What is meant by promptly, without delay? We all have good intentions. How many times, I mean, again, when I say we, I'm talking about me, really. How many times do I say, oh, I'm going to take care of this? Oh, I'm going to go home and write a check for this, or I'm going to tell this person how important that was, what they said, and then I don't. So it has to be promptly, without delay. Do good without delay. We die with good intentions. Or do what Nike says, just do it. <laughs> you know. And then what is meant to be joyful? Let, it, let us know Jesus. Jesus was joyful. Let us know Jesus. When we find our joy in the Lord, our strength is renewed and in, in, invigorated. And this joyfulness, God becomes our strength. It becomes contagious to others. Again, when I went to this Eucharist conference, first of all, I was angry because I was supposed to, I had gotten, uh, actually someone got me a ticket from California, believe it or not, a good friend. And uh, I was supposed to go all five days. I ended up not being able to go because um, the owner of the company was in Canada. And then when we had that big plane breakdown where all of the computers had shut down globally and no, all of the planes were down, he got stranded in Canada and I couldn't get to the conference. So I was pretty angry to start with. So then I thought, okay, so what am I going to do? I can listen to the talks online. I'm just going to, because I live in this contractor's world right now, which is very different than 24 years in the diocese, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to go there and see what it feels like to be Catholic again. You know, just to put it in perspective, the kind of world I'm working in right now, <laughs> God has a sense of humor. This, this trucker came up and said, you're a Catholic, and maybe you can explain this to me. There are a whole bunch of people, they're shutting down all of the roads, there are cops everywhere, I can't get my truck through, and then there's these white dresses with white burkas. I don't know, who are they? I go, oh, those were the Carmelites. <laughs> So this is the world I come from, right? They had no idea. They had never seen nuns before. This sounds crazy to you. It's not crazy to them. So that was an opportunity for me to explain to him who the Carmelites were and what wonderful work they did. And he actually became very engaged in it because everybody loves to listen to hope, goodness, and joy, right? So that's our ticket to success. We just need to talk with hope, goodness, and joy, and they'll listen. So anyway, it was so nice to be there because I, I could absorb just the love and the joy of all of these Catholics, and these were young people. And you can't tell me that 60,000 people didn't have problems in life, that none of them were grieving, none of them lost a spouse, none of them were dying of cancer or something. Out of 60,000 people, you would have never known they were so joyful. This is the joy of the gospel. And I walked away from there thinking, that's what I want to be when I grow up. And then I, you know, I go, well, no, Mary, you just need to pray more and, and hold on to your Catholic identity. So that's what joyful means. We live in a world where I have my truth and you can have yours. I don't know if you've ever watched the Kardashians. 
I was told a long time ago by a psychotherapist I need to watch the Kardashians because if I was going to work with the people I was working with at that particular time, I needed to understand where they're coming from. And to do that, the best way to do it would be to watch the Kardashians and any other show like them because that's, I need to know how people think. This is the culture we live in. If you're going to work with someone, you need to understand their culture. So I, I would faithfully watch the Kardashians and everybody made fun of me and that was okay. But I remember, I remember, I think it was, um, oh, which one was it? Um, Kim. <laughs> How did you know? You're watching too. <laughs> she's having a debate with someone and she's talking about, well, that's your truth, but this is my truth. And so everybody has their own truth, which goes back to the first part of my talk, where we have no universal standards anymore. Someone here told me once, well, did they, get, did they get upset with you when you told them you're going to the Eucharistic Congress? I go, no, because that was my truth. And um, they were happy with that. They didn't could care less, really. But there was no problem with me going there because I had mine and they had theirs. I mean, it's a very loving environment to be in, right, if you think about it. So anyway, um, but what we are seeing in young people jumping into one relationship after another with no sense of commitment and responsibility. Social media frenzies where thought, thoughtless comments are made and then check to see how many likes they get from it. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I see people on the phone checking their likes because they made some comment or they showed a picture of God knows what, you know. They changed their hair a little bit, took a picture, and then they're going in checking for their likes. Um, so living a life of rejection, hurt, and feelings, not feeling loved with a lot of emotional pain, because that goes with it, right? Because if they don't get enough likes, well, they must be hated. I mean, everything, there's, there's, there's no balance. There's no balance. And the balance is in our faith. Um, Again, according to Pew Research, roughly three in 10, that's 28% of the parents, are extremely or very worried that their teens use social media um, could lead to problems with anxiety or depression. Self-help, self-care are important values, but it should be in context of self-actualization and reflection. I can't tell you how many people have called in sick and said, you know, I need a mental health day. But you had a mental health day two weeks ago. Yeah, I need another mental health uh, Okay. Um, everybody has therapists, and um, you're not cool if you don't have one. And then, um, like I said, you're triggered by everything. And then I go, can you explain to me what mental health care means when you have one of those days? Well, I got my nails done, and then I got my hair done, you know, and then I was on Facebook, and I'm thinking, God, where was I when all this happened? My life would be so much easier. <laughs> anyway. So, but again, looking at everybody at this conference, I see joy, right? I, it's, just, it's, it's beautiful to watch. So when we are authentically joyful, others will mirror what they see and, um, and affirm our life-affirming choices. Uh, will be, and they want to imitate what you have when you're joyful. It's actually such a simple formula I wish I understood it better. I really did. I mean, I'm a fallen human being. I wish I understood it better about what we can really do to another human being by being loving and joyful and genuinely happy because they want that. Why are cliques so important to young people? And why are cliques so dangerous to young people? Because they feel like they belong. So let's cre create this amazing church where everybody feels like they belong. And the challenge is at least that we can control to some degree might become diminished to some degree. Going back to Edward III, again, he referred to the divided heart. If we do not fully commit our will to a decision, we will give only half-hearted commands. When we lose our interior peace about things that may or may not happen in the future, it is a sign that we are placing too much hope in the state of affairs we think is necessary to be happy. 
How many families are divided right now because of politics? I mean, that's terrible. It doesn't matter whose side you're on at this point. You still have to be family. And you still have to be civil. And yet we have now divided families because of a divided country. There are two main anxieties we struggle with. Concern of future and concern of the world. Aquinas says that worries over worldly matters are sinful when they distract us from pursuing spiritual goods, such as prayer and holiness. The Art of Making Good Judgment, Edward III says, I quote him a lot, it's a good book. You should, if, I recommend you buy it. Um, we must do three things. Learn from our own experiences and the experience of our elders. Form our, our minds from the right principles and cultivate in our hearts. Rightly ordered desires which will shape our judgment. So cultivate in our hearts rightly ordered desires which will shape our judgment. These rightly ordered desires are the offspring of the four cardinal virtues. We can do self-check, take to conversation with God, the question of how much of our time do we spend on news media compared to prayer. Um, you know, there's a, every night that uh, Ignatius would do this, the prayer, what's it called? Conscience? What's, it? what's that? Exactly. The examination of, of conscience. Very good, thanks. Um, he always had my back. <laughs> Yeah, examination of con it does, it's, it's actually a really good exercise. You don't even have to be a Christian for this. It's actually a very good exercise that we all, you know, it would be helpful if we all did it. Um, we need to try to not consume our life with drama or drama we create or drama we, we are consumed in by others. So many of us get trapped in the drama of others. And it's sinful because it's destructive. It never solves the problem. It causes hurt feelings. It exaggerates the problem to the point where, where it's not even accurate or honest anymore. Because I exaggerate it, tell you, you exaggerate, tell her, you exaggerate. And before, you don't even know what the drama's about anymore. It's sinful. And acquaintance. It's very honest about that. Having healthy concerns is important, but anxiety is not from the Lord. Perpetual anxiety creates constant tension to our souls. It's not healthy and affects negatively the people around us. I was telling Maria earlier, because I come from a different world right now, temporary, and um, I was telling her that um, before I got up here, I was starting to get nervous because it's been a long time since I've talked to a group of people, and I went into the chapel and I said, God, take away my lack of humility, right? Because why am I nervous? That's just a lack of humility. Because if, if whatever I have to say has any value at all, then he will provide. And anything else is self-serving. So take away that self-serving aspect of what I make, that's making me nervous, and, and we'll move forward. Um, so anyway, perpetual anxiety creates constant tension in our souls. It's not healthy and affects negatively the people around us. So I tried, I tried to pray for strength, for fortitude, courage, to endure my difficulties. Fortitude combats fear, makes us the people we were also born to be. Patience helps us endure our pain so we don't abandon the good. Or to quote again Pope Benedict, the ways of the Lord are not comfortable, but we were not created for comfort. We were created for greatness. In conclusion, Mahatma Gandhi said, you should be the change you wish to be. I'm sorry, you should be the change you wish to see. We can do amazing things individually. Collectively, we can create change that circumvents the challenges against the dignity of human uh, life. We do it by providing context, understanding, and clarity in our families and neighborhoods. We do it by speaking without a divided heart. History has shown through the doctors of the church, our saints, and often very, very simple people. Um, 
how Christianity can be shaped by offering us a blueprint towards a more just society. These were ordinary people doing extraordinary things. It is here where we can understand the meaning of St. John Paul's encyclical, The Gospel of Life, where we can celebrate the God of life, the God who gives us all life. Thank you. <laughs>